Thank you, dear heart, and welcome, everybody. Delighted that you're here. We get to play again. All things moving forward, rock and roll. Do we have anybody out there, Miss Jeannie? Is a hand up in the phone queue or anything happening in the chat room? Nope, it's all quiet on this end. All quiet. Okay, well, we've got a question that you someone had texted you or, or sent you on Facebook, and uh, it, it's a quote. Let's see. The writing is so small. Thomas? You like to be? Kind of hard to tell what the. Mo Thomas oh. has, uh, has a quote that says The reality you've been seeking has been within you even before your birth, hidden underneath your life. And the question is. And thanks for the question because it's a perfect one. Is can you translate this for me? And actually, this resonates for me the whole idea of what I'm doing with the quantum still point, the into being quantum still point personal intensive work. And I would shift the, the language around just a little bit. What was the gentleman's name that asked the question, Jenny? Um, Robert Lindsay. Robert? Okay. So, Robert, I'd shift the language around just a little bit to fit the uh, the language structure that we're using. You know, I love what, um, what's his name? Winston Churchill said, we have the privilege of being separated by a common language. So, the word reality there, I'm going to change to actuality in the context of this work. We define what is as actuality, and then each creature has its own perceptual reality. For instance, you know, I'm in a room right now with a television set, there's some art on the wall, there's a picture, there's a fan, there's a light, and there's some bottles of vitamins. And if there were a fly sitting on my shoulder looking in the same direction I am, I bet that fly wouldn't say, oh, there's a bottle of vitamins, there are some uh, some pieces of art on the wall, oh, there's a television over there. None of that would be constructed within the fly's mind. That would not fit within the fly's reality. The fly is going to look around and look for heat signatures where it will find warm blood and food. So that creature has a perceptual mind that serves its purpose. I brought a kitten in here and sat it on the stool beside me. The kitten would not look around and go, TV set, light, fan, phone, vitamins. The kitten would maybe be looking for warmth, someone to cuddle with, would maybe be looking for a toy that would be meaningful. But th there's no construct in the kitten's mind that can fathom the TV set. And so we could go on and on and on and, and look at every creature, its mind generates a construct that is useful to its purpose and survival. And that would be our definition of reality. So the question that I hear Mo asking here in the context of the language we would use is he's talking about the actuality that you've been seeking, the truth, the real deal, has been in you from the beginning. And it's been hidden underneath your ego-centered self, your programmed self. And so, I mean, that's so in alignment. I've been actually working for several days getting feedback from the people who have done the Into Being uh, quantum still point process, the three-day personal intensive. So I've been working on a definition and the definition is the answer to your question. So I'm going to just read, and, and this is something that's in process. I've actually gotten feedback from a couple of people who have done the process with me on a one-to-one -one basis. But this is, in, in detail, my offering would be, this is the answer to your question. So quantum, what is quantum still point into being quantum still point? Our practice is that of welcoming an instant of communication and healing 
through a moment of profound silence brought on by energy field work and the unwinding power of the still point breath. Known in the ancient Aramaic language as Rukud Kudsha, the breath, carrying wisdom from within and knowing that has always been with us is literally defined as a feminine elemental force within us that undoes the effects of our errors and teaches us the truth. A major component of undoing the effects of our errors is that of reclaiming the power that is energetically locked up and hidden within unresolved pain and trauma. That's one paragraph of a whole explanation, but for me, that would be the answer to your question, or how do we make sense of this? So to go back and read it specifically as Mo Thomas wrote it, the with with a, our matching language, the actuality that is at the root of your being that you've been seeking. I mean, everyone is seeking that, and the world goes, oh, look, I've got a shiny object over here. Oh, I've got something shiny here. Oh, I've got something you want. I've got money. I've got power. i got fame. i got sex. i got all kinds of things you want. Here, this is it. This is it. It's like, no, no, none of it. None of what the world offers is it. So what we've been seeking is within us from the instant of our inception. And the the life that I hear him talking about here, what, what most people call their lives, Yeshua in the ancient Aramaic said, in order for you to live, you've got to die. In other words, the self you think you are, the self that's based on getting the shiny objects and all the things the world says, oh, this will make you happy, this will fix it, this will make you feel good, da, da, da. All of that's fake. And the self that's based in that has to go. It is what hides the true state of being that we're searching for. So again, to go back to the definition of into being quantum still point, everything we do in the three days is geared to support awareness of any form of resistance by opening to the deepest still point, facilitating complete trust and the unreserved release of that resistance. So getting in touch with the resistance to truth and the unreserved release of that resistance, physical, mental, and emotional, which results in reaching a reset from within of physiology and mind that is generally considered to be impossible. The objective is to open the space for deep structural reorganization brought on by the freeing, if only for an instant, of the grip of the mind. Silence. Mystics and yogis spend years in an attempt to experience this relief from the mind. And then as part of the definition, I have a quote from Carl Jung, who looks without, that is, who looks for perception, dreams, who looks within, awakens. So that's what I hear Mo saying. Mo, in his quote, saying is, when you go inside, you wake up. Otherwise, you're caught in literal dreams, literal constructs that may or may not be useful at the moment, but they're not going to lead you to the truth of who you are. So there's this inner journey to be done. So, again, continuing with the definition of quantum still point, through this sacred inner journey, trust enters. Perception is quelled, and the voice of the past is weakened as physiology moves into a superconductor state that allows the full-blown experience of conscious, active, present love to enter. There it is. That's what Mo's talking about. It's been within you since before your birth, hidden beneath your own mind. So the through this sacred inner journey, trust enters, perception is quelled, and the voice of the past is weakened as physiology moves into a superconductor state that allows the full-blown experience of conscious, active, present love to enter and do the work of transmuting anything unlike itself. This connection to the authentic self and inner wisdom provides monumental process and relief. Reclaiming the source of your life force. 
This energy of love is the very life force that is designed to fuel physiology. And as resistance is reduced, there's a proportionate increase in energy flow. And joy is its natural byproduct. As the actual energy of love flows freely throughout the body and mind, dissociative memories often surface as overlays of both personal and generational patterns of energetic trauma are flushed out and liberated from tissue. Be still and know. Freed from the mental constructs of the past and projected future, being inspired incarnates quietly into the mind and the body that lets go and is still. By entering gently into this quiet space of profound stillness and inviting the mind, which causes all minds to be, to bring reorganization, restructuring, and sink you with deeper levels of presence, cause of wholeness, The bony structure of the body in its natural state is literally an intricate, delicately tuned, highly complex, self-adjusting antenna. The shape of an antenna determines the energies it both sends and receives. Physical, mental, and emotional trauma, including things like the birthing process, can compromise or destroy the structure's proper rhythm and motion. The principal actions at the core of the quantum still point are the freeing of restrictions and the mobilization of the structure which restores its movement as still point breath melts and dissolves all blocks. The physiological architecture of the human form is designed to move through a full range of shapes. And when you realize that the shape of an antenna determines the frequencies it receives and broadcasts, you realize that distortion results from any holding on and that the slightest restriction diminishes proper energy release in both directions. Forgiving inhibiting energies and restoring the full range of motion at the core of the structure facilitates reception of proper signals, primitive energies that are interchanged with that in which we live, move, and have our being. The process also cleans up energetic patterns, the instruction sets we continuously send to the world, with both attack and defense dissolved, the inevitable and natural shift in others as they respond to the new energetic instructions extended is usually called a miracle. One of the ancient mystics said, what you're looking for is what is looking. And once again, that's what I hear Mo speaking of here as he says the reality or the actuality you've been seeking has been within you even before your birth hidden underneath your life. So from this sweet space of quietness and serenity, which you extend to all unquiet minds, brings an instant of stillness where an awareness of the eternal presence of love has an opportunity to return. That's what's been with us since the beginning. And once achieved, remembering is quiet. So that may seem to be a little bit of an extended explanation, maybe bigger than what you were looking for, but it's just so perfect for, I mean, I've been working on this now, interacting with a few people that I've done the quantum still point personal intensive with and getting their feedback. And so it's just right there on the surface of my mind. And your question just brings it all forward. That really you know, what that writer has done is really summed up the whole sum and substance and body of work that I've developed over the last 50 years. 
moving out of the way what never belonged and reconnecting to what has been within you from the very beginning. There was a pretty famous guy about 2,000 years ago that said it differently. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Now, those words by the Greeks sound like something about some place off in space, but actually, in Aramaic, what it says is, seek ye first the community of love, and all other things will be made unto you. It's inside of you. It's been there from the beginning. It's actually what you are. What you're looking for is who you are. And what you're looking for Love is what is looking. So I hope that makes sense and fits. And if it arouses any questions, then please push one and let's have a conversation about it. If you happen to be there, Robert, I'd love to uh, to communicate with you, hear, hear your thoughts. If that triggered what you were looking for, if there's another refinement needed, or if you perhaps have some input in that regard. Would love to hear from you. And or if you're out there in listener land, our call-in number, if you're on one of those stations where we can't see you in our control panel, call-in number is 563-999-3581. If you call that number, you're listening to the show directly. And then if you push 1, that raises a hand in the control panel, and you and I and Jeannie will be having a conversation. And so... I'll look forward to hands going up if there are any thoughts, questions, any further explanation needed. I got a a text from another young lady who's been doing our work for several years this morning, and she had a a really good question uh, from uh, a friend of hers who knew that she was engaged in the Aramaic. And uh, so I had um, communicated with her, and sometime in the next few days, uh, hopefully, she's going to try to arrange the person who is asking her the question uh, to call into the show with her so that the three of us can have a conversation about those questions. Uh, and, and, and essentially, it, it pretty much comes down to um, a, a, another direction of answering the same question because really, in the last analysis, it's like, once you realize that it's not about getting stuff or power or all the things the world offers, then it's like, well, what else is there to do but to go for it? And uh, I say that from the perspective of someone who about 50 years ago decided to go for it and have been developing answers to those questions ever since and uh, and and realizing that the... Uh, the deepest levels of work around this whole topic are levels of work that usually come in an instant, but they are not instant, if that makes sense. You know, I used to uh, be in the the music business I actually had a partnership in a recording studio in Nashville, Tennessee. This is way back. And, uh, you know, a lot of people really admire and bless him. I understand he's been ill recently. Willie Nelson, he's in his 90s. He's been rocking for a long time. And people have thought of uh, or expressed, you know, how Willie has such a great voice. You know, he was just such an instant success. And, well, Few people realize or know that Willie Nelson's instant success came after he literally lived on the streets of Nashville for about 18 years before his voice finally struck. I go back to, uh, I really wish I had, had realized it way back then in our files in the office Willie had been, when he first started recording, before he went with RCA, and I had a, a partner in a thing called Fred Carter Studios, and uh, Willie did all his early recording, as did Waylon Jennings at our studio. And I wish I'd kept some of them now, because I had I had in the files, and it just never occurred to me, you know, what Willie Nelson would become, 
you know, this goes back into the, uh, geez, 70s, 60s, I guess. Anyway, uh, I have I had in the files pictures of Willie Nelson in a black suit with a white shirt and a, a little skinny black tie. <laughs> God, I wish I had those pictures today. <laughs> they'd be they'd probably be worth a fortune or maybe two fortunes. But anyway, I didn't keep any of them. I wish I had. So that uh, that would be my input on that question. And if you're out there in listener land and you have another question for us, I would love to hear your voice and uh, hear what's on your mind. Call the numbers, 563-999-3581. Again, if you call that number, you'll be listening to the show. And... If you push one, that'll raise a hand, and we will be having a conversation. So, Ms. Jeannie, do we have anybody out there in the phone queue with a hand up or anything happening in the chat room? No, it's all quiet on this end, but um, you need to send me the update that you read on the description of the quantum yes. still point. That, nothing like what I've got on the website. <laughs> I know. I, I've been working on it rather intensely, and it's not even close to finished yet. So, but I will send it to you as uh, as I bring it to the next level. It's not complete yet. Yeah, there, I've been I've been interacting with uh, with the folks who've uh, who've done this the process, and they've been giving input and what changes have been happening, and so. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely uh, moved a long way from our last conversation. <laughs> so do we have anybody out there with a uh, hand up in the phone queue or anybody happening in the chat room? No, it's all quiet. All is quiet. Well then... Let's dig in to uh, the next step in our conversation from the Enlightenment book. So I am going to pull Enlightenment out here. So we are on page 69, I believe, which is John chapter 3. And John chapter 3 just happens to fit in with the question we just answered and the conversation we just had. So I think that's perfect because it then starts to move that whole conversation to the next level. And so Yeshua has been answered a question in this particular chapter, 3, three to 21. Uh, actually, let's see. It's interesting. It starts at 3 instead of... So I actually don't have the question that was there, but he says, uh, He answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, if a man is not born anew, it is not possible for him to see the community of love. And... Uh, how does that fit with the conversation we just had? Well, if if I don't have the brain cells, if I don't have the connectedness to actuality, then how can I even start to comprehend it? How can I go there? I can't. And it is it has been metaphorically spoken of as being born again. And of course, it's a metaphor. Go back 2,000 years ago, and the, the man who you know, asked the question, who, who gets into that whole conversation, actually Nicodemus, and uh, you know, he turns to, to Yeshua, and of course he's an old man, and he says, well, how can an old man re-enter the belly of his mother for a second time to be reborn? And Yeshua answered and said, Truly I say to you that if a man cannot cause his birth of water and rukkah, 
he cannot enter the community of love. And if you think of, and, and my offering would be Yeshua was a physician. You know, he's referred to as a great physician, but, but many people don't think of him as a physician physician. It's just, oh, he does miracles. There's, there's nothing logical, rational, or real about what he does except that, you know, he performs these miracles. No, no. The man was a physician. He knew how this energy system worked. And you could imagine that living in the desert Hydration would be a very significant problem. And if a cell can't be hydrated, then it can't function properly because without high filtration, energy doesn't flow. And toxicity builds up. So if you think of water as baptism for the removal of toxicity from the structure, it's important. It goes beyond just you know, symbolically pouring water on someone's head. But then the second part he talks about is Rukha. And again, we're back to the quantum still point. What, what did I, I say in the definition? You know, first paragraph, what, what is it that sets this process into motion? Our practices of welcoming an instant of communication and healing through a moment of profound silence, drawn by energy field work, and the unwinding power of the still point breath. Rukha de Kudja. So if you go back in the Aramaic, in the creation story, it doesn't say the creator sent out his breath. Or pardon me, it doesn't say, pardon me, I got that backwards. It doesn't say the creator sent out his spirit like some sort of disembodied spirit being, the Holy Spirit, which most people refer to there. But in Aramaic, the words were Ruka de Kucha. The creator, our direct link to the presence of the love of the creator is through our breath. And it is the breath that facilitates the state that an energy is in. If I hold my breath around a trauma, I facilitate this, I, I hold, I facilitate the energy of that trauma being solidified in form. In fact, let me go to still another piece that I was working on this morning. Uh, which we've shared before, but it comes from the writing of a man who won the Nobel Prize in physics for creating the whole understanding of quantum physics. We're talking about quantum still point. So uh, let's listen to Max Planck for a minute. In all my research, I have never come across matter to me, the term matter implies a bundle of energy which is given form by an intelligent spirit. Whew. Max Planck, hard scientist, right out of the laboratory. I have never come across matter. As a man, he goes on to say, who's devoted his whole life to the most clear-headed science, to the study of matter, I can tell you, as a result of my research about atoms, this much. There is no matter as such. All matter, our entire world, originates and exists by virtue of a force which brings the particles of an atom to vibration and holds this minute solar system of the atom together. This mind is the matrix of all matter. Behind it, there's an intelligent mind. And we're back to answering the question that Robert asked again. The final statement in Max Planck's quote there says, we must assume behind this force is the existence of a conscious, intelligent mind. The actuality you've been seeking has been within you even before your birth, hidden underneath your life, is what Max Planck offers. When I extract my breath from an energy, 
I cause that energy to be reduced in its rate of vibration so as to produce what we call form. It becomes part of my structure. Let's listen to Albert Einstein. On such things as matter, we have been all wrong. What we have heretofore called matter is energy, energy whose vibrations have been so lowered as to be perceptible to the senses. There is no matter. Hold your breath. And that's the energy that causes these frequencies to become locked in form. Restore the breath. And again, from our definition of quantum still point, restore the breath, Ruka de Kudsha, which carries a wisdom from within, a knowing that has always been with us and is literally defined as a feminine elemental force that undoes the effects of errors and teaches the truth. Restore the breath to your trauma, and what happens to it? What's been solidified steps up its rate of vibration, and just like evaporating water, it's gone. So Yeshua is saying here, you need water, you need to be flushed with water, and you need the breath, or you're not going to touch into that. There has been so much trauma locked into the tissue structures of most people. I mean, just, just watch. Just take, take a day where you, you spend an hour or two in practice with other people and just watch as they're talking about when they hold their breath. And it's going to be when they're talking about something that they don't want to deal with. And the extraction of the breath, literally, as Max Planck is saying, causes that to solidify in form, to build the, into the atomic structure those frequencies. And if they are frequencies destructive to the coherent state of a human form, then the coherent state of a human form becomes incoherent that means it becomes diseased. So what was Yeshua doing? He's talking to people who are walking around with all sorts of terror and trauma and disease states in them, and he's saying you need to restore the breath fully because it's the breath that will unwind and liberate from you every energy of sin. Remembering that the word sin is simply an archery term in Aramaic that means off the mark. So restore the breath, Ruka de Kutcha. And what is Ruka de Kutcha? A feminine, d defined from the Aramaic, a feminine elemental force that undoes the effects of our ears and teaches us the truth. You've got to befriend the breath. And where you withhold it, you leave whatever's locked there, locked there. When you restore it, whatever's locked there is unwound. And so Yeshua in passage 6 here goes on to say, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of ruka is ruka. So that which is born of the breath. Now don't marvel at my telling you that you ought to, you, that you cause your birth anew. So, and then he uses another metaphor. He's like, okay, you don't understand this. Let me give you another, another way to understand it. The wind, you know, the wind blows where it wishes, and its voice is heard by you, but you know not whence it comes or whither it goes. In like manner, so also is every man born of Rukkah. So he's saying there is this elemental force that would be, we'd call the wind. But you don't know where it came from. You don't know where it's going, but you sure know by its effects that it's been here. When you engage in the proper use of the breath, and my offering would be that's the still point breath, the whole breath, or what was called the Holy Spirit, the whole breath, when you really trust that and engage that and let that flow and move through your structure, every bit of trauma from every generation of your, your, in your bloodline will be unwound in you. And guess what? You don't know where it came from, you don't know where it goes, but if you do it, you know by its effects that it's been here, just like the wind, is what he's saying. 
And Nicodemus responds and says, well, how can I make this to happen? How can I cause this to happen? And Yeshua says, you are an instructor of Israel and you do not know? Truly, truly, I say unto you, that which we know of that we speak and that which we see of that we testify and our testimony you don't accept it's like you don't want it to be that easy you want some big ritual you know purification and all these outer forms that you think are going to change the inner world you think that following this ritual and that ritual and this one and that one that that's what makes things sacred no it's not it's the core of it is the breath. And he goes on to say, if I speak of you of earthly things, and you can't believe that now, if I speak to you of heavenly things, how can you believe? No man rises to that higher level except he who descends from heaven. The Son of Man, he is a part of heaven. And, and when we're speaking here of heaven, we're talking about an energetic realm beyond the physical. Notice he's, he's comparing physical, non-physical. He's not talking about a place up in the sky. You know, so many people are playing saying, are you going to go to heaven after you die? Like, are you going to go to some place up in the sky? And, you know, uh, there are actually preachers who've, who've described, well, it's eight miles and it's two and it's between here and this point. I mean, it's silly. The whole conversation there is just silly. And Yeshua was saying, you have to open up. And the way you'll open up is through your breath. And you are, this is as, as our question was from Robert, you, this has been with you from the beginning. You are a part of this Malkuta Dishmea, this heavenly estate. That is, the community of love. You came from the community of love, and now you need to face and throw off everything unlike the community of love that is in you in order to return to your birthright, in order to be, quote-unquote, born again. So here he's just so straight up. You are a part of that, in Aramaic, Malkuta Dvishmea the community of love. And just as Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness, so it is necessary to raise the Son of Man, so that all who believe in him will not be lost, but will have for themselves eternal life. So what he's saying is, as each person steps up to the plate, does the work required to burn off the trauma of the generations. You know, remember that story. We're in the context of a story where I mean, literally a huge group of people are supposedly lost in a 35-square-mile area in the history of, of this whole scripture. And they're supposedly lost in this hot, sandy place for 40 years. And, and people think that, that it's about a hot, sandy place. And, and, and in truth, what it is is they're talking about those who get lost in the unconscious dynamics and have no connection to their heavenly estate, to the community of love, that they have generational patterns that are so filled with rage and guilt and grief and war and hatred and vengeance and pain and trauma and sorrow and suffering and loss and condemnation and viciousness that they've lost their connection to their own heavenly estate, which isn't within them. This is not a religious journey. It's about reclaiming who we are, where we live. So it's about raising awareness to that part of self that is that, quote-unquote, Malkutha Dishmea. For the Creator so holds that space of love that he gave his first begotten son. And it's interesting, the Greeks translate that as only begotten. Like, see, now we've got an exclusive. He's got the franchise, and you have to pay the dues to get to the franchise. Not so in Aramaic. 
he was not only begotten. He's not he's not the only one. But it makes for a good PR if you are not too sure about how your income's gonna go next week. If you got the only one then, you know, everybody has to come to, to me. But in Aramaic it's really clear Yeshua is the first begotten. Yeshua in that space and time is one who's open to this part of himself and is living his life from there. That is, his whole life is born from a connected space of active present love, and that's what he brings into the world. You know, you'll remember there's a point where he says, I'm in this world, but I'm not of it. it. Nothing you can do can cause anything to happen in me because I am not of this place. And you listen to people and how, oh, he made me mad, she made me sad, oh, that really made me afraid, oh, that really upset me, oh, they really, and, and the whole world is running their lives. You've got to give up your membership card to the one world universal religion to blame. So, first begotten, one who lived that, and then so that every man who believes, now let's break that word down, who is living, who will be living in that principle, will step into their own eternal life. And you look at I mean, there's such a strong component of, yes, on Judgment Day, he's going to come in a cloud and he's going to judge all those people that you've already determined are the bad ones. They tried to get him to do it first time around, and he said, no thanks, that's not my job. I come not to condemn the world. I'm here to offer a pathway to back to your original state back to what was with you from the beginning. So John 3.17, the Creator did not send Yeshua to condemn, but that there would be perfect life, that there was a model. Oh, here's how, oh, that's how you do it, Okay. Because it's the complexity of generations of rage and guilt and grief and childhood abuse and adult abuse and alcohol and drugs and murder and war. Who can figure out how to get free of that? I know personally that, I mean, one key idea came clear to me from the Aramaic and turned my life in a totally different direction. And it sure wasn't something that I figured out. But there was this guy 2,000 years ago who did. He said, here's how it works. If you have a mind, if you have a physiological device that is generating for you pain and trauma, you'll notice that there's an object of attention that you're focused on, and you want that object of attention to do something. And your own pain and trauma is projected into everything you see as long as you hold on to that. And you need to shebag. The word's been translated forgive, but it means to cancel. You need to look at the goal that's driving your mind. And when you do, you will collapse that whole construct in your mind. And when you breathe into what you've collapsed, you will free yourself of that energy. It's called forgiveness. Who could figure that out? I mean, I mean, we know it now because he brought it forward 2,000 years ago, but where? Show me anywhere, anywhere in the world. You know, the Buddhists come close to it. They say, oh, don't have any attachment. But having no attachment is a lifetime away from knowing that I have a goal, and if I hold to that goal, and that goal resonates pain in me, then I'll be stuck in pain, and I need to cancel that goal. Light years apart, and we had that affirmed a few years back when we were traveling, and the man who, in the Buddhist tradition, he's actually in California at that time, had a center there, and he had been ill, and the medical doctor that he went to had a set of my tapes, 
and he would not leave you know after the doctor treated him for some pretty serious stuff he'd been showing him one of the videos and he would not leave until the doctor's office until he'd watched all of those videos and uh, one of his students put a call into us and said hey he wants to meet you and we were like within just a few hours of where he was with the three day hole in our schedule and after we presented the Aramaic forgiveness process to him, he said, and this is a man who in the Buddhist tradition was considered to be, they called him Kempo, which was professor in the Buddhist tradition. He had been verified as, in their whole system of doing things, as the reincarnation of the Buddha of wisdom. And he said, Michael, we have nothing like this in our Buddhist tradition. Yeah, yeah, we got this. Don't be attached to anything. But not being attached knowing that if you're in pain that the way to uncover the root of your pain is to look at the goal that's driving your mind to bring that pain into your perceptual constructs and canceling that goal which will collapse that perceptual construct based in pain and when it collapses it will give you access to the underlying desert the underlying unconscious part of your mind remember that story of the Jews wandering in the desert how did they get out of the desert he said the old generation had to die off. That didn't mean everybody in old physical bodies had to physically die. It meant you had to access and address and heal every old cause in your mind from your generations. So what had to happen? The old generation had to die off. You had to clean up the causes. How do you do that? There is no place on planet Earth that you will find forgiveness, aside from the first century Aramaic teachings of Yeshua, and it's repeated again precisely in A Course in Miracles. I know nowhere else on the planet where it exists. It's how you access your own unconscious. It's how you get out of your own desert. So the Creator did not send Yeshua into the world to condemn people, but to show people how to achieve a perfect life. So that who believes, and we would say who would be living completely with him, there will be no condemnation. Whosoever causes himself not to believe, he has been condemned from the first. He who does not believe in the teachings of the first begotten son of the creator. And a man in Aramaic, a man and his teaching are one. So, And this is actually part of the question that I was saying someone had written to me and we'll have that conversation in full but when Yeshua says I'm the way the truth and the life he's not talking about himself as an ego being he's saying I've given you a teaching and here it speaks of here's those who do not believe in the teachings of the one who made this breakthrough for this is the judgment that the light brings to the world Man has loved darkness more than enlightenment. As their evil deeds are from, their evil, remember that word evil is related to sin. You're on the archery range, you fire at the bullseye, and you miss the bullseye, the scorekeeper yells sin. If you miss the target altogether, the scorekeeper informs you with the word evil. You've missed the target altogether. So it's the inner structure that needs to be cleaned up that's where these things come from for everyone doing these evilly motivated deeds hates light and does not seek light in order that the deeds will not be exposed people stay hidden in the darkness but when you choose to serve truth then you reach to an enlightenment so all will know that the deeds are from the presence of love, that one is functioning from the true state of human life. And, you know, to me, when you, when you start seeing this in its original form, you start seeing what was being offered. It's like, wow. And... It hasn't got to do with Sunday morning. 
It's got to do where, with where you live. And Miss Jeannie, we're down to about the last 10 minutes or so. So before we... Close out. Let's see if there's anybody in the phone queue with a hand up. Uh, anybody out there? Is this all making sense? Does anyone have a question, a thought, an answer for us? It's all quiet out here. We have nine minutes, so don't wait till the last two and then ask your question. Ask it now. So if you've got a question for us, which one? Call in numbers 563-999-3581. What's going on in your world? How can we support you? Come on, not everybody at once, please. Please. All right, well, let's go on to the next section then. I figured we might have some conversation there. That's that we've just covered a lot of territory. So then the next section in the Enlightenment book, we're on page seventy if you've got the book. If you don't have a copy of the book, and we're I believe this is day one hundred and one that we've been coming out of this, although a lot of it's been process work too, but uh, if you don't have a copy of Enlightenment and you'd like to get a copy, uh, and that's what we've been covering for the last 101 days, and what I've been reading from, and the book is entitled Enlightenment. It's what we've published so far from the Kabor's manuscript. The opening part of the book lays out some of the information about the manuscript, how it was found and such. Then there's some select passages, which are what I'm reading. And then in the back, there's a first century dictionary. So you can go back and, and look at what was Yeshua thinking when he spoke those words. How, do, how does what was firing his brain cells fit with what the word means to you today? And so you can go to our, uh, our catalog on our webpage, whyagain.org, and you can order the book. And it's, it's $25. And then the... Uh, the um, program automatically adds shipping. However, uh, for people who are listening to the show, if you want a copy of the book, instead of ordering it from the catalog and having to pay shipping for it, we'll pay the shipping if you just go to the bot, go to whyagain.org, whyagain.org, and at the bottom of the page, there's a donate button. If you go to the donate button, and if you donate, not 25 but $26. And the reason we ask you to do that is because pay, our our payment goes through. You don't have to have PayPal. You can do it with a credit card or whatever. But the payment goes through PayPal and they take a percentage off the top. So if you donate $26, that almost covers what PayPal takes, then we'll pay the shipping. So the shipping's free. So if you want a copy of Enlightenment, you can do that. And then John 4, 20 to 24 is the next section. Again, they're just select passages that are covered in the manuscript. So our forefathers worshipped at this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is where we will worship. So people are saying to Yeshua, and Yeshua says to this woman, Woman, believe me, the time comes when neither at this mountain nor Jerusalem will you worship your Creator, the source of your life, which he called the Father, which incidentally, for those who want to make him something special, he never talked about his Father. He talked about our Father. And by the way, what's generally called the Our Father is not a prayer, but it's a set of instructions for how to enter into a state of prayer, which means to become the space where you function out of and as active present love. It's a set of instructions. It's, it's not a prayer. You'll remember in other passages yesterday, it says, don't repeat and repeat like the pagans. <laughs> and what do people do every Sunday? Our Father art in heaven, hell be lame, I can go on that one. It's like, no. It's the set of instructions. You remember they said to him, they didn't say, would you say a prayer for us? No. They obviously had a problem because they didn't understand what this whole idea meant. So they said, teach us to pray. 
And he taught them, gave them a set of instructions. And in essence, the instructions are how to become the space of active love, which is what prayer means. Actually, prayer in Aramaic means to set a trap for God. Remember the Creator, God is love. This is just fact where we live. This isn't about religion or Sunday morning. It is the flow of love that is the flow of the Creator through our lives. Love flowing through a cell is life itself, and everything we do to inhibit the flow of love through our own cellular structure, we're destroying ourselves. Everything we do to take the lid off and allow that full flow of love, it's that presence of love that will transmute and transform every untoward energy that's ever been held in your genes or in your bloodline and free both you and your bloodline from it, future and past of this whole thing. So he goes on to say, you worship something that you just don't know, you don't understand. We worship, and, and my best definition for the word worship would be to emulate. It's not about, oh, bowing down hands and knees. That's what kings want. They want people who will prostrate themselves and, and, you know, worship them. The creator is not the cosmic weakling that needs everybody to bow down and go, oh, emulate, to function out of your created essence, which is the same essence of the creator, to function out of and as love. And he's saying to her, lady, you don't even know what it is that you want to emulate. And we do know. And that perfect life will come from this understanding. But the hour comes and has now come that those who worship his truth worship as Ruka and also as truth for the Father wants worshipers. In other words, the, the emulation of love will be carried throughout your structure by your breath. And if there's anything that inhibits that flow of love through your structure, when you apply the breath, that's what will dissolve it. That's what will create that transmutation of energy. Anything unlike itself dissolves in the presence of full breath. Now, some people don't want to go there because I don't want to feel what's in there. Sooner or later, you have to go there to fully reclaim your human life. Because the creator is Ruka, is the breath, and those that emulate him as the breath and as complete truth are emulating or worshiping as they should. So the bottom line is function as the presence of love to where your human life begins and ends. And then, let's see, we're down to just a couple of minutes, and I'm going to just, instead of going into a new topic, we're down to actually just inform me. We have about 90 seconds, so I'm just going to invite everybody to take the next minute or so to just get quiet. <sighs> just take a deep breath, let everything go. And if you notice any form of tightness anywhere in your structure where the breath has trouble reaching, focus there. Imagine that you're breathing through that part of your structure and let the breath soften. Let it open and let it go. Gene tells me this sounds like my Darth Vader breath, but I just invite you to just let your breath just flow fully through your structure every cell right down to your toes, your calves, your knees, your fingertips, your nose. Let the breath just move throughout your structure. It's what will flush and wash everything that never belonged in you, out of you. Where there's tightness, allow the breath to go there and soften. Where there's pain, Imagine feeling that pain as a sensation. 
and taking your breath to that sensation, letting it soften and let it go. And know the truth that you are the light of the world. And have the best year out of your eternal life. It's an awesome gift to give the world. <laughs>